guys, I'm here with Merwin Abbott. And he reached out to me because he has some really interesting theories about the function of the, the pyramids and, and how they could potentially be early versions of air compressors. And also um, maybe some stuff, some other, some other building structures that are found in Egypt. So I am gonna like, like we're gonna listen to his theory and see what he has to say. And uh, yeah, so also he he works with stone in real life. Sometimes he's an artist and he does a lot of stuff. So what, what Merwin, why don't you tell us exactly how you came to this and like what what all it is you do? <clears throat> well, I'm an artist and. Um... So I, as an artist, I have had experience on a lot of different things. I, I'm a welder, I've worked in the medical field, I've traveled in all kinds of different places and I've seen a lot of different things. And so um, kind of when you're a jack of all trades like I am, it, you start picking up little bits of here and there and, and then suddenly things start coming together in a way that you don't normally see them. Uh, just when they're presented by somebody on a particular topic. And so, um, should, I, should I just start sharing with you my PowerPoint yeah, presentation? Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, let's, let's, okay. let's just try to do that. Yeah, so he's going to, he put together a PowerPoint and he's going to try to show us like how he came to this conclusion. Yeah, I, I, uh, I kind of cover all this stuff in the PowerPoint. And so you'll, you'll see it and it'll make uh, sense that way. Cool. And if you're listening, this is one you might want to watch because yeah, it's got some visuals. Okay, this, so the subject is sand blasters and air compressors in ancient Egypt. And one of the things that's kind of outstanding or uh, synonymous with this whole subject is the idea of bulls. And so uh, I'll just kind of like talk about that for a second. The bull is had represented the living creator and I think that you would say that as Ptah or something like that. While it lived and became Osiris when it died and was then referred to as the god Osiris. The death of the Apis bull symbolized the eternal nature of life. Now, <clears throat> so what a lot of people don't understand is that something as simple as a pencil takes 43 people from around the world to make it. And so that, that means somebody has to mine the ore that eventually becomes the metal. Somebody has to go out in the woods and cut the tree. And somebody else has to log it and bring it into the sawmill that makes the wood. So that's an example of what we're talking about today. Because when we look in the past and we see something that's a remnant of uh, some of another civilization. A lot of times we don't understand the far-reaching uh, element of how many people might have been involved, or how many technologies might have been involved in uh, whatever it was that we're looking at. Same thing with the pencil. So major difference between the pyramids of Egypt and other places. Uh, first of all, I, I'm not suggesting that the pyramids in, uh, in Peru or some of the other places around the world are the same kind of thing that we're talking about in Egypt. They may have had a completely different purpose. So I'm just totally open to that. Uh, I just, I'm primarily talking about the pyramids of Egypt. There is no artistic drawings inside the Great Pyramid or other nearby pyramids. If the pyramids were designed to be the house, to house the dead, then why weren't a lot of mummies found inside? Compare the Valley of the Kings. We see that there are many artistic paintings on the walls. And this tomb area is all underground, while the pyramids are above and below ground, and no art. Many speculate that the pyramids of Egypt were tombs or a giant healing device, 
holding special vibratory energy that resonates in the key of A, or a way to transcend the world we live in, or possibly mirror the sky as a celestial absor observatory. And so we ask the question, are these concepts correct? They may be, but we need to, we need to not be locked into one way of thinking. If, if we, um, if somebody tells us a certain story as say that it's fact, then just like saying the pyramids were tombs, then we don't think outside that box. We need to try to think outside the box. So I'm not an Egypt, an Egyptian expert, and I watch many YouTube videos by Brian Forster of Hidden Inca Tours, Jimmy with Bright Insight, Ben on Uncharted X, Matthew Sibson of Ancient Architects, and also Nikki Anna Jones. <laughs> <laughs> I was thrilled when Jimmy of Bright Insight discussed the recot structure of Western Africa. I knew of the structure from previous research but the connection to Atlantis was fascinating and on point. During Jimmy's recent trip to Egypt, he visited the large unfinished obelisk that is at Aswan. And while he was walking around, made the observation that the scoop marks in the granite looked like they were made from a sandwich. One of the things that I want to notice here about this great, uh, this big obelisk, you notice the little area that's cut out. Uh, can you see my my cursor? Yeah, I can see your cursor. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and you notice the area that's cut out right here. Um, <clears throat> if I was in a process of blasting sand or, or uh, granite out of this pit, I would also want to have a way to wash all that out of there. And I think that that's probably why this channel was cut so that the water that would be washing that out could be washed out, so it could wash out, could drain out. And so that's uh, one of the things I want to point out there. Um, also, there's a whole lot of scoop marks and we're gonna look at that a little bit closer here in a minute. Um, so now I'm gonna to go to um, this video. All right, dolerite stone hammers this is how they say they did it. Let's see what it does on rose granite. Maybe if I pour some water on it. <laughs> does that hurt your hands? How hard is that? Uh, it kind of sucks. It doesn't really <laughs> hurt yet. It's not doing anything. Are you doing a little drying? Yeah, Dust. Well. Oh, this is a good shot. You just chopping up dust. Now he is getting stuff off the edge. This is what we need—a whole team. Give these men some beer. They'll have an obelisk in a few hours. Oh my god. I mean, they are—they are getting into it, but man, that was. Are you arthritic yet? This is literally the mainstream explanation for how this entire quarry was accomplished, including this 1,200-ton. 140 foot long obelisk. Literally, that is the explanation. Which doesn't make sense, especially when you look at all the scoop marks, which looks more indicative, and I'm not suggesting, but it looks more indicative of uh, sandblasting. I've heard other people, stonemasons, say that. Um, but how they did it is a mystery. It's yet to be demonstrated for people using these dolerite stone hammers to do something like this, especially with the nature of the corners and the scoop marks underneath and throughout. It's just silly, honestly, it is a silly explanation. I'm not suggesting they had power. It's deep, I got pictures of me down in there. It's very tall. When you're standing at the base of the uh, of it inside the trench, it is probably nine or so feet high, just a, just a guess. Higher than my hand can reach and I'm five foot 10. Yeah, that is definitely not how they did it. That's just silly. Is the same exact stone that has been pounded on for more than 20 plus years by 
countless tens of thousands or even hundreds of thousands of tourists and the thing's barely dented. Clearly that's not the method. And by the way, what are those scoop marks about? That doesn't look like, I mean, how there's so many of them and they're all just, no, that's not from lining up a bunch of people and pounding away with a stone hammer. But not only that, guys, look underneath the thing. Look at those unique scoop marks. How are you gonna get in there with those stone hammers and bang away at that? It's not feasible, it holds absolutely no water, and as you just saw in the video, it's been debunked. So this in itself should be raising questions, new questions, as to exploring how the ancients were able to accomplish these amazing feats. So several years ago, my wife and I were invited to the home of an older Amish couple. The man, out, the man was showing me around outside and he took me to a shed where he had an electric generator, which ran an air compressor, which pumped compressed air into a 500 gallon tank that looked like a propane tank. From the tank, a pressurized line went underground to the basement of the Amish home. The air ran a washing machine. The reason that I bring this up is most of us have never even experienced something like that. And so um, I introduce it as to, to, to make the point that here's somebody that's compressing air and they're using air to accomplish something that was normal for them, washing clothes. Ancient Egypt had available the basic elements of wind, fire, water, and earth. There is no evidence that ancient Egypt was much more fertile and lush. It is just as likely that there was a lot of sand also. High winds coming across the desert would kick up the sand and erode surfaces. This is something that could easily be observed. Even today, there are places where cars are sandblasted with high winds in a windstorm. It would not take long before paint and metal would be eroded away. Having access to air under pressure would mean that you could easily fire a furnace instead of using a camel skin billows. This is an example of uh, Egyptian sword makers, what they would, what they can do with their um, equipment to make swords. So we're going, we're going to look at another video now. But why would I want to buy it when I can get one made to order? These must be some of the world's last swordsmiths to make swords for combat. A blade of the finest cutting steel, which 500 years ago would have come from European cities like Toledo or Padua. Today's Takaba is more likely to have been forged out of Toyota bumpers. So um, one of the things that we see there in that is here is an ancient way to uh, use some billows to fire a forge. And uh, so they're, they're, they're heating that, those coals up with probably a goat skin or a camel skin uh, billows. And uh, it's very, um, very old, a very old procedure, but or primitive is a way to might say it. But if you're going to do it in a in a way that support that's kind of like part of a civilization, like Egypt was back then, then you might want to have something quite a bit bigger, especially if you're talking about furnaces, if you're talking about a big furnace. And uh, my, you know, I studied a lot in the Bible. That's a lot of my background and a lot of my a lot of the bible old testament history is in is around the middle east in in egypt and stuff like that and uh, you know, you have babylon you have uh, 
Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego, that story where they were in the fiery furnace. And so um, how did they have such a big fiery furnace and what did they use it for? And how did they, uh, how did they make it hot? So that's kind of like the, the thought process that's behind some of this thought. So um, anyway, so we'll show you some more. Very cool. <clears throat> this is in the Boston Museum of Fine Arts. We tend to look back at history and uh, put our interpretation on what we're seeing, when in fact we may be mistaken. And I want to acknowledge that I may be mistaken also. So, uh, but if we don't uh, think outside the box, we're never going to accomplish what we're really trying to accomplish, which is to solve the mystery of what it is that we're looking at. King Menkara and, and his queen, this is, the, this is the statue of them, one of the finest pieces of Egyptian sculpture known. This pear, this pear statue came to light in a trench in the King's Valley Temple. In their serene expressions, clear and clear sense of purpose, these two images are representative of the idealized concept of the monarchy in Egypt's classical or pyramid age. The super, superlative craftsmanship is evident in both the faces and the rendering of the knee and leg uh, musculature. The queen's knees are softly portrayed through her full length garment. This is pretty amazing because um, it's pretty hard stone. You know, I stood there and took this picture and um, I was looking at it and thinking about how awesome it was to be able to make something that smooth and that nice back at that time. But, you know, obviously I did not have the same thought awareness that I had that I have today. That's probably a little over 10 years ago that I was there visiting that place, the museum. We may be more technical, technically advanced, but we've lost knowledge. As an example, how many kids graduate from high school or college with experience at growing enough food to sustain them for a year from their own life-given garden? Zero. Yeah. And you think about how many kids are growing up in the cities today. They're, they're just totally dependent upon big agriculture to, to bring them food from the field that's been sprayed with all kinds of chemicals and all that stuff. And it, it didn't take very long for that to happen. It's just one generation, basically, because our parents and grandparents did that. So water, here's another interesting fact. Water cannot be compressed, but water can be used to compress air. This is another one of the statues in uh, the Boston Museum of Fine Art. This is Amenhotep II. And uh, he was the seventh ruler of dynasty team, best known as a warrior and athlete. He appears here in a worshipful pose, kneeling, holding a round offering jar in each hand. Offering to the gods was one of the king's primary obligations. Doubtless, the statue once stood in a temple offering to the God in, perpe in perpetuity. So now we're gonna watch another short clip. Such a pretty statue. <laughs> yeah, it's another, another example of, of really good uh, artistic work. Mm -hmm. um, and the person has to ask how that happened. So now let's see. Now I'm gonna I'm gonna kill some of this some of the volume on this.
<clears throat> okay, what's happening in this? Uh, can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you. Okay. What is happening here in this uh, spiral pump? Um, water is being picked up in that large end there. And as it goes, as it turns over with the current is pushing the wheel, turning it. As it turns over, water is going down the pipes toward the center of the wheel. And so um, it picks up water and air, water and air. And the process of picking up that air, it gets compressed as it gets closer to the center of the wheel. And then it gets pushed upstream, up through pipe to the place where the reservoir is. Wow, that's really clever. Yeah. And that's, that's an example of how water is used to compress, how air is used to compress, or, or water is used to compress uh, air. And then that, that air then actually works as a pump because it pressurizes as it goes up. Yeah, so it's trying to escape. Yeah, right. It's pretty interesting technology. Ancient Egypt experienced a lot of seasonal flooding, helping to make the Nile Valley very fertile. In 1906, the Aswan Dam was built to generate electricity and to control the flow of water. The Aswan Dam is in South Egypt. The north of the dam is Aswan Quarry where the large unfinished obelisk is located. So <clears throat> I'm going to put my mouse. You can see this is where the Aswan Dam is. Mm -hmm. And the Aswan Quarry is right in this area. So um, the As see, back in the, in the ancient times, whenever the Nile flooded, it would flood this whole area and um, People just basically had to get out of the way because water got really high back then, uh, depending upon the amount of rain and everything that they had. But I don't know if you remember seeing those big uh, monumental stone sculptures that they're really huge uh, of a, I guess it's a pharaoh or somebody oh, sitting, yeah. To sitting side by side, there are two of them. Yeah, yeah, the, yeah. Those are uh, they're close. They're on your way to the Valley of the Kings somewhere. Yeah. Over. Okay. And um, I've seen photographs of water around the base of those. Mm. And so that kind of gives you an idea of how high the water would get in at various times. Yeah, I mean that's that was their main form of irrigation at one point, right? I mean. Uh, yes. Yes. Yeah, they didn't have uh, pumps and things like that that we like we have today. And uh, of course they didn't have the dams or anything like that either. So knowing that water could be used as a force to pressurize air would give ancient Egyptians a powerful tool for use in sandblasting. Is there any evidence for sandblasting technology? Hypothesis, if ancient Egyptians were able to dig down into the earth and reach the water table and connect to the Nile, then water flooding the underground network of tunnels could create a pressurized system and even tidal changes might be affected. Are the pyramids of Egypt an old form of compressed air compressor? As Jimmy was climbing up through the passageways of the Great Pyramid, he scraped his back and made the comment that it seemed that those passageways were not meant to be used for an average upright person to walk in, no. while other areas opened up in a big way. And here's an example. <clears throat> um, over here is where the Osiris shaft is. And there's water in this bottom chamber here. 
which would also indicate that water would also be over in this area. And isn't it interesting that we have always kind of, I think in the back of our mind, we've wondered why there wasn't like a, here's you have this great big monument out there, but there's no big opening to it, like for a temple. It's, it, was, it was hidden. It took a long time for people to find out where that opening was. And they had to blow it up, actually. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. So um, pretty interesting. Now, this is what the Osiris shaft looks like, and it goes down about 100 feet into the ground. Over here, it points out it's 30 meters down, so that's about 100 feet. And um, there's these little cubby holes here. We don't really know what they were for other than they've got some boxes in there that I guess there's never been any kind of mummies been found in them. But um, and they're not uh, even there's no hieroglyphs on them either. They're just grand. Yeah, houses. yeah, right, exactly. And there's another one down here in the very bottom, and it's underwater. So um, that's a very interesting thing. So and I'm going to now play a short clip from uh, Brian Forster as he was doing his thing. And now looking down into the next level which again is carved into the bedrock. And this was an amazing experience, which we'll do every year we do Egypt. And this is looking up from the next level. The gate, of course, or grating is over top to keep people from invading the space. And now climbing down into this next level. There's nothing actually in the level. It's a rectangular room of limestone. But next is where it gets very interesting. Now we're looking down into the next level of the Osiris shaft. And this is looking back from that level before going down into the deeper level. You can see the tool marks in the background. And when we're in the next level, there are six niches and two very large hard stone boxes. What's strange about them is this one seems to have internal catastrophic damage by a force unknown. And then the other box has strange stains on it, almost like an organic material. Again, what it is is presently unknown. And now looking down into the final level of the Osiris shaft. And when we get down there, we'll notice here is Yusuf Awiyan standing on top of a submerged giant granite box. And the water here is crystal clear. Very amazing sight. Astonishing to experience. Pretty amazing, isn't it? Yeah, and that's really amazing that the guy went into the water. <laughs> yes. One of the things about this is, um, as you saw those big openings there, I'm not, obviously, I'm not answering how it was that they cut these big square uh, channels down into the earth. I'm not addressing that. I'm only addressing how an ancient air compressor might work. And obviously, if you could accomplish that, then there would be some other things that could happen as a result. Um, <clears throat> so, um, but what, what we see here is we see these great big square uh, channels that are cut not only horizontally, but vertically down into the earth for this for some purpose. And I don't believe that it was for the burying of somebody. Yeah. Uh, it doesn't make sense. And there's no artwork or anything to indicate that this was any kind of a person of significance. As an example to, to explain that, we've already seen some sculptures 
of some of the famous pharaohs. So if they're going to go to the trouble of making a nice sculpture to, to memorialize them, it would seem that they would also, if they were gonna create a shaft like this and bury themselves in it, that there would be some indication that it was them. Um, and we have that indication when you look at the Valley of the Kings, because you have all these pieces of artwork on the walls. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Yeah, it's a very good point. And when you are in the pyramids, it is, I mean, like even the subterranean room, you know, where there is like the water uh, well at the very bottom of that, that part in the Great Pyramid. Um, it's the, it's like it carved out of bedrock. It's not smooth. It's not, people were never meant to be in there or, I mean, it, it was utilitarian in my opinion and not, there, there was no, and like you said, there, like when you do go to the Valley of the Kings, Valley of the Queens, it's ornate, beautiful. Everything looks so pristine. Uh, even the temples have they have they have hieroglyphics everywhere. You can possibly put uh, put your hand on any wall, and there's nothing. Not even the the giant granite box in the in the king's chamber. Nothing. It's just it's all utilitarian. It's just it it's uh that that is granite, polished, smooth granite in the king's chamber but there's nothing written on it and there's no design element or anything. It's amazing. <laughs> okay, so the pyramids have very tightly fitting stone, which weigh many tons, granite and limestone. And in the absence of having huge factories and foundries like we have today, the only way that they could contain all that uh, pressurized air would be taking stone and uh, stacking it up in some kind of airtight fashion. It would be sort of like taking your, your two hands and putting them together and blowing into them and the strength of your hands. To get... Yes, yes, yeah, exactly. My party trick. Yeah. <laughs> I used to do notes. Oh, wait. There you go. <laughs> Very good. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it would be necessary to have a way to contain the air in order to compress it. Is this the reason there is no easy and open access to the pyramids? In one of Brian Forrester's most recent videos, he takes us through a tunnel under the step pyramid and ends up looking into a massive chamber inside the step pyramid. Now this is this is where the uh, this is the step pyramid, and we notice that there's all kinds of ancient architecture around it. Mm -hmm. And uh, it would indicate to me that here again you have, you know, I would consider even a, a giant air compressor to be like a power plant because you would you could come off of that pretty much like like the people the Amish people that have a washing machine you could use that air for doing different things and so you have um, these structures around we don't exactly know what they're for um, okay. I'm sure Go you ahead. see those little, um, you see that, uh, okay, right next to the step pyramid, how there's the, the, it looks like there's the little foyer area, but there's all those little, yeah, right there. So mm -hmm. they, I don't even know what that's technically called because it's differently labeled on different stuff, but our tour guide, Muhammad Ibrahim called it the, the hospital. And so there it looks like there would have at some point been wherever those, those structures that are still there, it looks like there was a little courtyard and then there were they were mimicked on the other side but those structures are now gone on the other side of it oh, not okay. on the other side there but on the like where see where the structures are if you look yeah. like on the other like across oh, from them right here yeah, yeah uh, that those are there's only like one that remains across from it but anyway there are these boxes that are are in there and they um you walk up to them they're not they're not boxes they're more like 
uh, you know, what do you call that where people have like a little enclave where they would stick like their Virgin Mary in the wall, but it would. Oh yeah. Okay. It's, so it's like, it's, it'll be a flat wall, but it has a little box within the wall, like a little shelf. A little cope. A little yeah, cope. Little, so yeah. you, and I think there's five that are remaining and there would have been at one point twelve. Anyway, we, you go into them and I even, I even have video of this and um, a lot of us filmed, filmed them. There is a frequency, there's a sound when you stick your head in the little cove and it's different per box. And so our tour is like, well, it's, it has something to do with the water running underneath. Like, we don't know. It's just, it still works. We don't know. Like you still hear stuff in it. And they called the hospital because they said people were healed by frequencies, but that's just sort of legend. But no one really actually knows what the function of it is. But what I found completely interesting about that is that each of the five boxes or coves is it like I, I filmed one with my iPhone and then a couple other guys filmed theirs with their iPhone and then another guy from our tour he um, maybe I'll be able to get him to send me that video because he did put it on another podcast in the Earth Ancients podcast but um, but I gave him my footage to use to put in that as well but anyway uh, they each have like one was 50, 50 hertz, one was 60 hertz, one was 70 hertz. Wow. So they all are different hertz. So I think that was really fascinating. And you can hear it. It's not just like woo woo, like, oh, like you can feel the vibes. Like, no, it's like it sounds like a refrigerator running, like a and you stick your head out and it's normal. You stick your head in. Wow. So something with 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 air and water and something is is going on with these so like i don't think you're so far off i i uh what you um i did look at one of your videos and i noticed that you were talking about something like that in one of your videos and it may have been this what, what you're talking about i think about. this is this was this yeah. is where because that for me this was the thing that i came around going like why aren't we talking about this this is like the craziest thing it is so crazy that it still has different frequencies. Like, I, I don't know. I'm still like, for me, the next time I go to Egypt, I'm going to be getting like a really nice recording device and sticking it in each of them and letting it stay there for like 10 minutes. And then going to compare. I mean, I have, I have plans on how I'm going to study <laughs> what's going on with this. Like, that's not okay. Yes. <laughs> okay. Very good. Okay. Side note. <laughs> That's great. Okay, uh, so I'm going to play another quick video here. And this, of course, is the famous Step Pyramid of Djoser at Saqqara. And what's intriguing about it is that today we get to actually go deep inside this magnificent construction. It has had scaffolding around it for many many years that they've been doing restoration as you can see and Egyptologists regard this as likely the first true pyramid and I'm in agreement with that. I think this is the first attempt by the dynastic people to build a large pyramidal structure to build okay, a large so let's, pyramidal let's, structure. Let's hear what he has to say right there and think about that for a minute. If this is the first ancient pyramid, and it, it would kind of indicate that, I mean, here's all this rough stone. I mean, small stuff. Yeah, it's not, it's not megalithic at all like the Great Pyramid. Yeah. And so it's like maybe an experiment. Let's see if we can make this work, you know? Mm -hmm. And so uh, you hear they, they put all this, stuff together and made this big thing that um you know here's all this weight right on top of the middle of this right on top of it have you ever been inside of it uh when i went we weren't allowed inside they had okay. closed it off I, I went around it but um no we weren't allowed to go inside at that point did you see his video about this i did i this is an amazing video okay cool <laughs> All right, so. And the Great Pyramid and other two massive pyramids on the Giza Plateau are much, much older, constructed by a completely different civilization that obviously had very advanced technology. So 
So you can see the construction technique here is relatively simple with blocks that um, one or two or a few strong men could quite easily handle and then lots of mortar used in its construction in comparison with the Great Pyramid system where you have very little if any mortar used in the construction. So we got to walk around the entire structure. Here are two curious circular holes that go straight through the stone. Not necessarily examples of advanced technology, but quite curious. And where we're going to go is right to the very core, the center of the step pyramid itself. You can see that this area is likely bedrock and above that the whole pyramid of Djoser was built on top of it. So these columns are likely dynastic, put in as supports at some point in time. And just have a look at this. There is the subterranean aspect of the step pyramid and people there for scale. Now we're not sure how far down this goes. I have heard stories. You see this giant granite box at the bottom, which is likely recycled stone from an earlier construction. And when the camera goes up, you can see that the step pyramid was built on top of this subterranean masterwork. So there is the box again, quite massive slabs of granite, but I have heard stories that in fact the underground system here goes much, much deeper than what we were able to see on this day. Pretty amazing. Very amazing. Yeah, I mean, and I have also heard stories that the, so, if you are driving by a car, Saqqara is, that's where the set pyramid is in Saqqara. Saqqara is about 30 minutes by a car from um, Giza Plateau. And they, there are rumors that there's tunnel systems that connect the two. Wow, interesting. Mm -hmm. See, that, that just says a lot about the effort that they went to to make something like this work. It had to have been some type of a, mechanism, a machine of some type. It yeah. would seem like that. Yeah, I think so too. And I think a lot of times we look at, like it was a really good point you made earlier about how we look at things through our own lens. But um, yeah. I like the idea of maybe they did use like compressed air as their power source rather than electricity per se. Yes. That would make a lot of sense. Yes. So at the bottom of the massive chamber, there is a large granite box. Is there an opening under the box going deep into the earth and connecting to the Nile River, Nile water? If so, the box could act as a valve mechanism and could be adjusted by adding weight to the box. So my point I don't know if you see, I, I have built ram pumps. And one of the things you can do with ram pumps is um, you can adjust the valve so that it's kind of like in, it works in time. It, it synchronizes are you, are you with the water ram, pressure. Like what kind of pump again? Oh, oh. A ram pump. Have you ever heard of a ram I've pump? I have heard of a ram pump, no. Okay. Do a search on Google and then you'll, 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 or on YouTube and you'll see several. Okay. Um, the way the, the way the ramp pump works is water flows from a high place down to a low place inside of a pipe. And um, so like, as an example, if you've got a 20 foot length of pipe and you were to fill it full of water. That would be a lot of weight. Okay. And 
uh, it's one thing if that water is liquid, you might not think it was very influential. But if you were to take that water, that water and you were to freeze it and make it a solid core of water, of, of frozen water, you could imagine how much power that could have. You could, you could use it as a, as a driving force, okay? So um, if you have water falling, three feet down to the valve mechanism at the bottom, you can take that three feet and you can pump water 30 feet up. It's 10 to one ratio. So if you take that water, you take that 20 foot pipe and you turn it up on its end so that it's a 20 foot fall, then you could pump 200 feet in the air. You could pump 200 feet up. I live in- If, if you I, took the pyramids, <laughs> how big they are, you could, you could pump really far. <laughs> yeah. And uh, it it would depend upon on um, what how it was used or or how it was set up. Of course, I have we have no idea. We're just speculating. Mm -hmm. uh, but um, I make I'm trying to explain how how that valve mechanism works because you can tune you can play with that uh, valve mechanism and you can put more weight on it and you can slow its response to the to the action of the water falling in the pipe. Um, I built several of them, but at first I didn't know how it all worked. I thought it was all around the, the valve mechanism at the bottom. But actually that water falling in the pipe is what you get is where the term ram pump means comes from because it's water following down this pipe like a ram is hitting it really like a ram that's busting through a door through a wall like a gate of a of a castle like a ram like that see mm. and uh so it's that kind of force and so this water falling in this pipe uh it actually when it hits that ram when it hits there's two there's two valves involved. Water flows down the pipe and goes through the open first valve until there's so much pressure that it shuts off that first valve. And when it shuts off the first valve, it causes that, that pressure to push through the second valve. And then there's a rebound in the water that's in the long pipe and the water kind of goes back up, kind of like a wave action. And then that first valve opens up again and water starts flowing again through that first valve and then shuts off and shows it through the next valve. And that's how water is pumped with a ramp pump. So um, when you carve with water, like when you carve stone with water, how much pressure do you need? It would depend upon um, how much time you want to take. <laughs> because uh, my friend, I, in my, uh, my friend locally that makes these big uh, boxes that are used for sandblasting uh, tombstones, uh, he said that it's just a matter of, of uh, time. It's, you know, how much time do you want to do it, you know, take to do it. And so like you could do it with water or you could do it with water and sand. He said, and I'm gonna kind of go over that point towards the end of this segment because it's on the PowerPoint presentation too, but we'll get there. <laughs> and uh, so let's go back to that and, and um, we'll see the next part. Okay, cool. So at the bottom of the massive chamber, there's a large granite box. Is there an opening under the box going deep into the earth? I don't know this, so that would be something that's a mystery at this point. 
and connecting to the Nile water? If so, the box could act as a valve mechanism and could be adjusted by adding weight to the box. So uh, that would kind of like, um, might have some effect on what could happen. <clears throat> Well, I do know they have unexplained flooding that they don't quite know how to account for. Um, and okay. that must come from um, the, you know, the, the water table levels. So, yes. yeah. Yeah, that makes sense. What was the real purpose of the pyramids? Tombs for pharaohs would be a great fodder for a mystery story. A vibratory system for healing is great for bringing tourists. Who would want to look at a huge pile of rocks that was an ancient air compressor? <laughs> so this is the my friend builds. He builds these large aluminum. The the, the main structure or ribs of it is uh, steel, but then aluminum uh, around the outside, and. Um, there's rollers inside and uh, you put your uh, tombstones on that roller rolling system and then uh, you stand outside these windows and you have a computer program there that's in the middle in the front that you see that um, controls how the sand blaster works and blasts in the, the letters and so forth that's on the on the stones. So that's what that's about. He tells me the material that they use for this application is actually softer than granite, but it has sharp microscopic edges. He says that granite can be polished with granite sand combined with water, which helps move the dust away as the surface is being finished. This is the head of King Menkara, the old kingdom, dynasty four, and that's travertine or Egyptian alabaster. You see the serpent there, a lot of people, I mean, I, there's different ideas about what the serpent means, but what I'm, what I pick up from my uh, interaction is that it represents wisdom. And uh, I think that's a quite an interesting concept because these symbols um, are seen in a lot of different places. And if you use that symbol um, consistently, it can help to unlock what the what the what the uh, bigger picture is supposed to tell you. Mm -hmm. But we can go over that later. King, Man this is another picture uh, or another statue of King Mankara. And this, this is all something I saw at the Boston Museum. And when it was first found, it was all in pieces. I think they've added some parts to it that were not found, but basically it was all in pieces in, um, in this temple. Probably I will never go to Egypt even though it's fascinating. I share these ideas so that the younger ones will have something to think about and look for as they explore the area. Remember the pencil, many parts that make up the whole. Look for pieces. It's time to start to solve these mysteries, such as the recot structure, so we can gain back knowledge we have lost. I hope you've appreciated this. Hit that like button, subscribe, bang the bell for notifications. <laughs> uh thank you so much Barb Merwin this is amazing like I mean <laughs> like that that was a great presentation really it was and I think I think you're um you you've definitely presented me with another way of looking at it but I also kind of think about it in terms of especially when you put um in, in context of the furnace and like getting the um the sword making kind of ab abilities and I think wow well they really would have benefited from having a, a an available air air pressure source you know yes. rather than just a bag so 
whether this is true or not true, I don't know, but I do think it does give me another lens to look at things with. And, you know, a lot of things work in, in this realm, like they, they do seem functional, not ornamental. They are, uh, they, they definitely have the, uh, the structure that would probably support compress compression. So yeah, I mean, like a lot of things about this really do make a lot of sense. And there is a ton of stone carving. So, and the scoop marks, it's not just the Aswan quarry that has scoop marks. Like I, I could put, I could inject a bunch of photos of other things that I've had. I have like, there's that, that weird little ice cream scoop thing on the back of a lot of unfinished uh, stones, like wherever they did, like that's how they, even when I went to the, um, Seraphium, mm -hmm. Seraphium. Yeah, the Seraphium, they have, uh, some of the, there was, if you know, they're the bot, those, those big boxes that also don't, most of them don't have hieroglyphics or anything on them. And there's never been bodies found in them. They're just some random, really another crazy mystery to look into, but, uh, the, the rooms, the bedrock is, is definitely looks like it's kind of scooped out. It's, it's like an unfinished weird look. So mm. I, yeah, I don't know. This is definitely, this is definitely food for fodder. Yeah. You know, and, and when you look at the, at that chamber inside, who would think, who would have thought going into the middle of the step pyramid that there would be that huge chamber? Right. And, you know, that's not open to the public to go down there and explore. It's just not. So that is, uh, I mean, that just makes me want to go so much more. <laughs> <laughs> Yes, yes, I, I get you. I definitely understand that. And, you know, you look at that and you think to, to yourself, why would they have such a big opening in the middle of that? Yeah, yeah, it, it, it's, um, I recently, I was reading, um, I just interviewed him the other day, his name's Jared Murphy, and he, he has a book called, It's Not Aliens, Worse Is Us, but he has he used as an example in the end of his book, like he took um, a picture of the inside of the Chernobyl uh, nuclear reactor. And it's, it's this, it's this beautiful circular, you know, concrete chamber with all these weird squares and stuff in it. Okay, well, fast forward a 1000 years from now, when the place has still been abandoned because of the nuclear melt or reactor meltdown. And if, if people like without any context come up to it, and they'll be like, Oh, this is a beautiful place of worship and temple. I mean, <laughs> right. You know, I mean, I feel like, I feel like we're kind of maybe doing that with this. Yes. Yes, exactly. Yes. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, it, uh, you know, people, uh, their mind goes to the, to the idea of, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. Okay. So we we'll look around and we kind of look around for, things that might identify with previous generations to, to indicate that they're spiritual too. Well, this is, this is an, a building, it must be a temple. <laughs> right, yeah, so, I mean, that's the big uh, academia, like uh, fault is, I mean, I, I, was, I have a master's in art history and all it is is like, oh, this little figurine is a, this is for uh, fertility fertility it's like well they sure must have liked their uh, little statues for fertility quite a lot because there's i mean if <laughs> yeah. if if, 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 a, if a if a female representation has boobs on it on any on any kind of little scope fertility fertility I, I mean it's just the most bizarre yeah. um way in which we think about these little people it's always ceremony and ritual and temples yes and fertility it's yes. just kind of kind of crazy that we we really do think of them as like cavemen knocking on stuff and that's not necessarily the case yes you're exactly right <clears throat> well um um is there anything about what i presented that uh you think let's let's um kind of brainstorm well, about some of I that. do know I, I i did like the um like when you emailed me you talked about how um, to get like those smooth surfaces on, on stone, they would put like a, I think you said maybe like a leather skin and then do the water on top of that. So oh, you know what I forgot, I forgot to, to throw in another video. So I'm going to show you something. I forgot this. We're going to do one more. <laughs> okay. 
So what we have here is a, a, a black 12 by 24 marker, three inches thick. And today we're gonna to show you how to, uh, how we do a traditional sandblasted stone. So what we're doing now is we're applying a, a rubber mask stencil to the top of the stone. What we're gonna do next is take out Pop out all the lettering of this stone. So what we're doing now is that we uh, we peel out the cutout area, uh, the lettering, and the design graphic. This design happens to be um, the Mother Mary. So what we're doing now is uh, peeling the letters out. As you can see here we've. Uh, Taking the uh, the rubber mask, off the stencil for Mary. Now it's as simple as peeling out the letters here. So now you can see here we've got all the letters peeled out and the design, and we're going to get ready to uh, sandblast this. And what we do is we use sand at a high power, at a precise nozzle coming out, and that erodes away the uh, the black area of the stone there. So you'll see that next. Now what we're doing is we're spraying, uh, spraying the paint into the sandblasted area of the stone. So we're going to peel the stencil off of the sandblasted stone. How deep would you say this is, Dan? Uh, it goes down about an eighth of an inch. So there we go. So here we have it, guys. Uh, finished product, uh, sandblasted stone. As you can see, the stone looks great. That's cool. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that was really cool. Yeah. <laughs> Um, wow, and that didn't take them very long to do, so that's pretty cool. Yeah, the, the work is in the artwork that's involved because they have to, like, for instance, I did something similar uh, to the picture that I sent you, you know, uh, with me and my wife standing beside that um, thing that I, I created. Um, and so you take that uh, film that he put over it, it's kind of a rubber mat with a sticky back to it. And uh, for myself, I did that, I did a drawing on it. And then I went back over it with a razor blade and cut all the lines where, the, where I had drawn and then pulled them out. And then I took it back to the uh, monument place here locally in town and they sandblasted it for me. And they just took the surface level, layer off. Uh, it wasn't a very thick piece. They didn't want to bust it or anything with the pressure. Mm -hmm. So they just took the glaze off of it. And so, but when you look at it, you could see everything it was that I had done on it. And um, it was interesting because whenever it rained, it kind of disappeared. But when it dried out, it would come back pretty, pretty easy to see. Yeah. <laughs> Very cool. So that's, that's kind of helping you to understand how I've had all these different experiences that caused me to start realizing that there's something to that idea that it's sandblasted work. 
that's involved there. It may be uh, sandblasting with water also, uh, which water would help to move the elements away, you know. Uh, just depends on, on what it is that they were doing, but they had plenty of sand, it looked to me like, in Egypt, so. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, it's not so far-fetched, basically. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Cool.